A new documentary is about to start in Australia, a film called Blind Ambition, uh, in a film that has just won uh, or has won the uh, Audience Award at Tribeca. So it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the uh, co-directors of uh, the film, Robert Coe and Warwick Ross. Warwick and Robert, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thanks very Thanks, much, Peter. Good to be here. <laughs> and I have vague memories of talking, maybe it was just to you, Warwick, about Red Obsession, uh, which goes back a number of years about uh, uh, the uh, Australian wine industry in China. And I'm sure you can now make a sequel where there is no Australian wine industry in China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a very short documentary. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. No, no, this is such a fascinating story about four Zimbabwean South African men uh, who uh, were involved in the World Wine Blind Tasting Championships. Wow, who knew that existed? So, <laughs> so tell me about the steps along the way that uh, you were able to both make this uh, documentary. So we, we first heard about the story of uh, our four protagonists through Jancis Robinson, actually. So Jancis, we interviewed for Red Obsession. She was one of the, the, the key interviewees for that film. And um, as the years had, have gone on after Red Obsession, she's always kept an eye out for interesting stories because she knew we were looking for something. And um, she contacted us through Andrew Kayard, who's a master of wine, who was in, involved with Red Obsession also, um, and said, you really have to talk with these four guys. They live in Cape Town, they're sommeliers, but they have the most amazing backstory and they're planning to go to this, this world championship. Um, so within um, a, a day or two of that suggestion, Rob and I were already Skyping with the four guys. Uh, they were in Cape Town and we were here in Australia. And we were so impressed with their story that within three weeks, Rob and I were in Cape Town with a film crew. Wow, yeah, and, and I gather they gave you full permission to film them, to discuss anything with them? Yeah, it was one of those aspects whereby they were somewhat tentative at first. You know, I guess no one really enjoys having a camera thrown or thrust in front of their face. And it's one of those things that when you're not used to it, it does take a bit of time to break down that barrier. And ultimately from the get-go, they were on board, you know, full access. Um, they told us they were willing to talk about everything, but it really did take a bit of breaking down, a bit of developing a rapport, uh, just spending hours and days and months with the guys to eventually get the best out of them. And ultimately, we were filming for close to two years um, on and off as we travelled back to Zimbabwe, back to South Africa and, uh, and, and back to France. So it was, it was, yeah, full access was provided. And, and the fact, one of the key things that got us over the line was the fact that they had seen Red Obsession and they loved the film. So that was one of those really great happenstances that, yes, they've seen it, they liked it, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I mean, all four of them have such interesting backstories and, uh, and tales to tell, um, some of which are uh, really, you know, fairly sensitive and, and so on. But uh, I gather that they were able to talk about some of the racism and other things that they have had to deal with. Yes, yes. Some of them um, had very confronting stories. Um, and Joseph in, in particular, whose family was starving in Zimbabwe, and he decided that he and his wife um, needed to get out of Zimbabwe however they could. And they were people smuggled across the border into South Africa. But no sooner had they arrived in South Africa than they were subjected to discrimination and xenophobic attacks. Everything they had with them, which wasn't much, was stolen from them. Um, so it's, it, their hardships were extreme. And to think what they overcame to get from that point to representing Zimbabwe at the World Wine Tasting Championships is a, uh, is a, is, it's a pretty unusual story uh, and one of great determination, yeah. It, it certainly is, and that comes across so well in, in the documentary, Blind Ambition. And uh, this French coach who, uh, I mean, you, I suppose you, you always need to have a villain somewhere along the line, but uh, this guy was incredible. <laughs> Warwick and I said as soon as we met Denny that we couldn't have scripted a better character. 
it was just an utter delight and absolute torture to work with him, <laughs> knowing the material that we'd have in the edit room, but also, you know, film enduring the long days of filming with him. But we were we were lucky from a creative point of view to have a character like that that would cause conflict, that would set the guys back. It was it was a, it was he was a villain, um, but he also did have a, a lot of heart. And we, we did try to get that across, that he was just um, someone who was caught up in this competition and was attempting to, to do well for the four teams in Barbwe. It's just that his efforts were, were not well uh, undertaken. And so ultimately it was, it was fantastic having him as a character in the film. And, um, and yeah, it was, we were lucky. Absolutely, yeah. Now, as I said just before, I'm not so familiar with these uh, with an international uh, blind wine tasting um, sort of competition and so on. How long has that been around, and and how massive is it in terms of its uh, international exposure? Well, it was started, I think, around 2014. So it's not uh, a, a competition that's been around for a long time. But it was set up by the Revue de Vin de France uh, as a, a, a platform for, uh, for tasters to be able to form national teams, which was a pretty exciting concept. There's, there's been tasting competitions around for a long time for sommeliers and others who want to try individually, but this was a team competition. Um, and so in many respects was like a little bit like the Olympics. And that's, I think, what appealed to the guys and appealed to us. This was a way that they could represent their country, which was more important to them than re representing themselves. Uh, and so they had their jackets made with Team Zimbabwe on the back, wrap, proudly wrapped the Zim flag around their, you know, around their shoulders. Um, uh, so the platform itself, um, it was a, was a wonderful way to get uh, an international competition and sort of nation based. So in that room where we filmed the competition, there were roughly 25 countries competing. And the interesting thing when you have a look at that is you realize just how groundbreaking uh, this effort was by our four Zimbabweans, because you know, as the camera moves across the room, there are white faces wall to wall, to quote Genesis Robinson. And the uh, only team um, uh, of black guys were the Zimbabweans and they were there right in the middle of the room and you know it spoke a lot about diversity or the lack of in in the uh, wine business um, at the, and still at the moment still is a lack of diversity but that's what show these guys as such groundbreakers I think. Absolutely but but this idea of being able to taste and identify uh, the origins of wine, where they came from, uh, the, the uh, particular tastes and, and smells and all that sort of thing that, that goes into producing wine. I mean, that is a real art. And, and uh, I can imagine that uh, that is so difficult to be able to uh, uh, perform. It's an art. And also, as um, uh, Andrew Kayad explains in the film, it's almost like a mathematical equation. So it's very science and and art, art, art based, or at least, you know, creatively based. These guys, when we started looking into it, we realized that if you break down the five categories that they have to determine, which is the country, the region, the producer, the vintage, and the grape. If you multiply the various kinds of grapes that are grown around the world, times the regions, times the vintages that have ever had wine produced, it, it goes into the billions and trillions of possibilities almost when, when you actually break it down into a decision tree or a probability. So when you look at it like that mathematically, you think, oh, my God, the, the odds are phenomenal. How is anyone going to do this? And then when you overlay that with the skill, being able to detect whether this is a grape that, you know, this is Nebbiolo or is it Sauvignon Blanc or is it Sangiovese? And what was really fascinating for Warwick and I was the way that the guys approached it was totally different to how we'd ever seen anyone else approach wine tasting. They really were using um, fruits that were, that were indigenous to Zimbabwe, so stuff that they had grown up with. So not using textbook descriptions like blueberries and raspberries and strawberries or other elements that, that, that you use to describe a wine. They were talking about gavi, which was tree bark. And they said, if you can smell tree bark, okay, we know we're in Italy. Or they'll say, 
you know, or we're tasting nguru or ngeni, these, these berries that were indigenous to where one of our um, protagonists, Tinashe, grew up in the mountains on the border of Mozambique. And he, uh, they would then go, oh, okay, we know it's Shannon then. And so it, it really was remarkable seeing how they applied their culture, their heritage, and brought that to the world of wine. And all of a sudden we realized that that was this really rich secondary layer to the film whereby as this, at the same time that the guys were trying to determine where the wine is from, they're also asking this question of themselves, where do I belong? Where am I from? I'm a refugee, but where do I call home? And there was this, this symmetry that we saw in what they were trying to achieve, but also what they, in, in the competition, but what they were trying to achieve with their lives. You know, what is this connection to land that we have? Why is it that I want to go home to Zimbabwe and I just want to feel my feet in the, in, you know, in the soil rooted down? It was, that was something that, that we, we recognised over time and was definitely something that popped up after uh, spending a, a, a significant amount of time with the guys and understanding that concept that they were dealing with. Yeah, that is really interesting. And you're right, that dual edge to, uh, to the, um, I suppose, the narrative, if you like to put it that way, of the documentary. So, yeah, that, that is really interesting. Now, obviously, this is a formative documentary. You know, don't know the outcome uh, in advance. Uh, and so you, you film them on the way, all that sort of thing. That in itself must be challenging because you don't know how it's going to conclude. Well, that's quite right. That's the nature of documentary. You know, you, uh, you, you, uh, you start on this journey, but you have no idea where it's going to end up. Uh, in many respects, you just hold on to the story and you let it pull you around. Um, at the end, you're sitting in an editing room with all of this um, footage and you then have to make sort of a cohesive um, uh, story from it. But um, I think there were some basic things we knew at the very beginning, which was... Um, ostensibly and sort of superficially in many respects. This was a story about four blokes that were going to compete at a world championship. Uh, and so that was kind of an exciting prospect, but we, we did wonder whether they, they had any possible chance of winning. And if you really look at it, um, you know, if you looked at it on, on paper, you would say they had absolutely zero chance. But as the film progressed, we really began to believe in their talent and their incredible uh, at, at picking certain things and using their indigenous skills, indigenous fruits from Zimbabwe to be able to pick things. So, um, you know, you begin getting swept along with that current and um, without, you know, uh, without uh, giving away anything about where they ended up. The interesting thing with this story is it became obvious to me and Rob that regardless of where they came in this competition, there was a much deeper story to tell which is the story of each one of their, their hardships and what they had to overcome just to even get to the competition, let alone how they would do there. And, you know, and where their lives would go after the competition. Um, and they've all taken their own career path now and they're doing remarkable things. I was going to ask you about that. Where are they now? And, uh, and, and how did they respond to, the, uh, to your documentary? <laughs> They uh, were so thrilled because when you, when you embark on a documentary like this, you really are taking on quite an onerous task of making sure you represent real people. You know, this isn't scripted. You want to make sure that their story is reflected in a way that they are proud of and that is accurate and that it, it's quite a significant uh, undertaking. And so you're always nervous as a filmmaker, I think, of documentaries when you've got existing protagonists when you show them the film. Luckily, they, they were really happy with uh, what Warwick and I had done and uh, our broader team, and um, they, they, they love it. They do love it, and it was really exciting to be able to screen it to them just before the, uh, the world premiere in, uh, in Tribeca uh, in New York. But um, going back to your, your, your initial question was... Well, where are they now? <laughs> where are they now? Of course. So where are they now? So Pardon has moved. He's still in the Netherlands, um, uh, where where we end up in the film with him. Uh, Tinashe is living in Johannesburg and has left the te test, kitchen, test kitchen as a uh, head sommelier there, and is now running his own sommelier business, sort of a consultancy, mm -hmm. but also uh, is making uh, commercial wines and doing very well. They now export to the US and UK, and he just told me last night that. Uh, they're speaking with an Australian importer, which is very exciting. 
Joseph is doing the same, uh, very, very similar to, to Tinashe. He's quit his job as a sommelier and is now focusing full time on wine, uh, winemaking, which is great. And his Mosi wine brand is doing very well too, also exporting to the US and the UK. And Marvin has uh, left Cape Grace Hotel and is now working at, can you remember what restaurant it is? It's Green Something Warwick. Mm, uh, a, a, very, a very prestigious um, high level restaurant in, uh, in Cape Town still. But it, it, is, it has been remarkable because we've been filming for so long to be able to watch their journey and their progression. And they, are, they continue to succeed at every level. It's a, a task that they see and they just are so determined uh, to do well. And it, it, it has been astonishing to watch their, uh, watch their journey. That is terrific to see that, uh, that journey and to uh, um, film it over two years and then to see what's, uh, what uh, the outcome is. We won't, of course, reveal the, what happens in the documentary, but certainly where they are now, which is terrific to hear that they like the documentary. So the film is releasing in Australia uh, next week, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a Tribeca. I gather Blind Ambition will have currency in other countries around the world. Yes, yes. We have, um, through our sales agent, protagonist in London, we've made sales to the United States, um, United Kingdom, um, uh, countries throughout Europe, Japan. So it's it's getting good traction from, from buyers everywhere. I think it's one of those stories that is sort of, it's uplifting. Uh, so it has sort of a universal theme to it, I think, which can be translated into any of those countries. Um, yeah, we're very hopeful it'll do well. Oh, absolutely. It's a, yeah, it's an excellent documentary. Um, and so I'm quite in, intrigued, uh, Robert and Warwick. Are you working on another film at the moment? Yeah, we have uh, a few films that we're working on at the moment, uh, a few m mainly scripted um, that we're working on at the moment. There is one documentary that we're focused on, but always looking out for that next story, particularly in the wine world. We yeah. don't know what it'll be, but, um, you know, Warwick and I have always reflecting on both Red Obsession and Blind Ambition. These are stories that are set in the wine world, but they generally don't have much to do about wine. <laughs> they have a, lo a lot to do about um, other aspects with uh, Blind Ambition, obviously much more human story and with Red Obsession and economic story. But who knows uh, what the next one will be in that respect. But yeah, we are working on a few projects at the moment. Oh, excellent news. And I must ask you about the experience of Tribeca. Were you able to be there when it was uh, screened? Well, unfortunately, no, we weren't able to go. Yeah, everybody was in lockdown. Nobody was traveling. You know, there were no airplanes, so we, we couldn't go. Red Obsession uh, was invited to screen at uh, Tribeca as well. And we were there for that, you know, when that film was out. And we were so looking forward to going because it's a wonderful festival, Robert De Niro's festival in New York. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't uh, we couldn't make it. But it was you know it was some some compensation that we won the audience award, mm. and that came through by email. That good news. So yeah, that was something. Well, congratulations on that, and and uh, uh, and I look forward to your next documentaries. Which um, yeah, it, something to do with the wine industry. Maybe it is something to do with China and how they have uh, now rejected Australian wines. That could be an interesting <laughs> follow up documentary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, anyway, whatever. Look, congratulations on Blind Ambition, uh, screening in uh, cinemas next week. Uh, and we've been speaking to uh, Warwick Ross and Robert Coe all about Blind Ambition. Go and see it. Thanks so much for talking with me. Thanks, Peter. It's been a pleasure, Peter. Thank you. Bye-bye.